Hey everyone, and thanks again for joining us here at the Foundry Church. My name is Justin Colleen, and I'm the worship director here. We are so glad that you're here to see all that God is doing in and through his church right now. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, make sure you go and like our Facebook page. There you will find additional content as well as the teachings that you see here on our YouTube channel. And speaking of, if you haven't subscribed for that yet, make sure you do that right now while you're here. Uh, with that said, let's go to our summer series right now, Judah, the Kingdom Chronicles. My name's David. I was a shepherd boy, the youngest of seven. Yet the Lord, the God of Israel, chose me from my whole family to be king over Israel forever. He chose Judah as leader, and from the tribe of Judah, he chose my family. And from my father's sons, he was pleased to make me king over all Israel. declared to me through the prophet. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him. So now, I charge you in the sight of all Israel, and of the assembly of the Lord, and in the hearing of our God, be careful to follow all the commandments of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and pass it on as in inheritance to your descendants forever. And I instructed Solomon my son and pled to those who came after to acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. And these are the sons of David, Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Ahaziah, Athaliah, Joash, Amaziah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Amon, Josiah. And now, Lord God, keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. Do as you promise so that your name will be great forever. I am King Asa. I serve God faithfully. I took away their idols. I tore down the Asherah pole. I rid this nation of the shrine of prostitutes. I did it all. You would think that God would repay me better than to leave me like this. Hi, my name is Bob. Uh, I've been a pastor in West Michigan for the last 15 years or so. Now I'm a farmer, which is, you're thinking a weird transition. I would say, yes, it is. Trust me. Uh, I know that. Um, honored to be here. I've known Pastor Eric. He's in Zambia for quite a while. and went to seminary with him. The funniest story is the first time I met him, I walked in a theology class wondering where to sit. So I sit in the back. And I look over, and the guy I'm sitting next to is on Facebook, and it's Pastor Eric. 
And the more I look and the more I examine, I realize he's not just on Facebook, but he's playing No Limit Hold'em on Facebook. And I say, hey, deal me in. And uh, that was the first time I met him. And there's amazing things that are happening here. I got to know him and the friendship. But you guys are doing amazing things. It's an honor to be here. And today we need to talk about King Asa. And to start it off, and I was thinking about talking about King Asa, I want to talk about plan A, and I want to talk about plan B. And the real question is, what do you do when you're standing here sort of in the middle thinking, should I choose plan A or should I choose plan B? Maybe it's a problem, maybe it's an opportunity, maybe uh, it's, it's something big, maybe it's something small where there is a path in front of me and I can go here and here are all the details. This is plan A. But there's also a path over here I could choose. This is plan B. And you're standing here and you're wondering, what should I do? I'm not sure which way to go. How do you handle that situation? We've all had that. I mean, it's happened to me so many times. I think one of the funniest times of like plan A or plan B is when I went to Tennessee with uh, uh, another couple. I was kind of new married, maybe a year or two. My wife's name is Lindsay. We decided we would go there. It was going to be an interesting trip because we thought, let's take the motor home. Not because we were going to stay in it, because I guess it was Tennessee. I don't know. But we decided we are going to go see uh, the Great Smoky Mountains. That's what we were going to do. And when we get down there, one of the things we thought we should do is, let's go hiking. Not because any of us had ever hiked before. Nobody had. We just thought it would be fun. So we walk into like the entrance of the trail, and there's this beautiful stream to the right. There's these mountains, and there's signs everywhere. And one said, waterfall, 2.5 miles expert. And we're like, we're going to the waterfall. Uh, not because we had hiked. And so we start hiking, and it gets uh, really... Um, steep and hard and difficult. I'm noticing like all the people that are hiking, uh, as, as I'm looking, they all have like the sportswear on, you know, the athletic gear and uh, Arteryx and North Face and, and, and they were actually athletic, not just because it was comfortable. And so they're, they're hiking and I'm in shorts and flip flops and it <laughs> doesn't work very well. And eventually my party, they all quit. Like, all the Sherpas left. My wife included just was gone. I'm like, I'm going to the top. Like, you are not going to stop. And so I get to the top, and I'm thinking, grand waterfall. And it was like this 15-foot, like, water just barely peeing over it. There's 40. I just take the picture, and I'm disappointed. And I turn, and I look. I'm like, go down this windy trail that took forever to get up. And there's that stream. And I'm thinking, or I could go to the stream, straight down the mountain. I wouldn't have to go all around. So I take off, and I'm wondering, plan A? Or plan B? Which should I choose? And of course, 23, 24, there's no frontal lobe development yet. So I choose <laughs> I choose the path uh, of the water. It's the fastest. Take off the flip-flops, I'm going down. All of a sudden, the trail disappears. And, and then I start getting nervous, and I started thinking, and I realized, maybe there's more than one stream in the Smoky Mountains. That's what dawned on me, and I start walking. I haven't seen the trail for a long time around me, and then there's all these thoughts going through your heads, and one of the thoughts, honestly, was like, I'm going to be on the 10 o'clock news, like <laughs> local pastor missing, party went to Subway, whatever it says, and so you start praying, and you start pleading with God, and, and you make all these deals that you'll never be able to keep. If you just help me, then I'll get, you know, whatever it is, and finally what happens is I hear someone to my right, and there's the path. And they're wondering, why is this kid standing in the water with flip-flops? And I walk out, and there it was. But the funny thing was, I'm literally on a mountain going, on the top of it, going, should I choose plan A or should I choose plan B? Like, literally there. And, and, and I know it's funny. It's an easy Well, You shouldn't have chose what you do. You're right. It, sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's small. But all of us have been, fa- everyone in here has been faced with that, s- that question. Plan A, plan B, and you don't know. I'm, I'm thinking like the youngest students in here whose all their friends are going one way, acting one way. They're doing one thing. And you could follow this and I could choose this. But I could also say, no, I'm going a different way. I'm going to live this way. And each of them have repercussions. Cushions, each of them could be good or bad, and you're wondering plan A or plan B. How about the, like, the older students in here who are going to graduate, and they're wondering in their life, like, which way should I go? And there's, there's this plan A, and there's this college, and I could go here, and it's all laid out in front of me, but I could also choose this path and work and training, and it's over here, and you're trying to make sense of, like, where should I go? There's young families out there who've been standing here and things have been going well for them. They love their family. They love what's going on. 
they love the travel, and they could just like keep continuing going here. But there's also this talk, it's like they could add a child. And either you could go this way, or we could decide, okay, we're going to start a bigger family. How about the person who has an opportunity? They've worked at this job. They're doing amazing things. There, there is opportunity. They could continue. They love what they're doing, and it's right here. I could keep this, but all of a sudden, standing before them is another opportunity, plan B. They didn't even think about They were offered, and it would take them this way, and maybe this is beneficial to go here, and they're wondering, plan A or plan B. Or maybe even the people in here who've worked for 35 years, 30 years, and they love what they do. They get up in the morning. They still have energy. People still love that they're there. And they could keep going a couple more years. I could keep this route up. I enjoy my job. This is plan A. But there's also retirement, which would be plan B. And I could travel and I could do here. And they're standing in the middle wondering, okay, which path? See, we've all been there. Doesn't matter what age, plan A or plan B. What do you do when you're standing here in the middle? What if I told you, despite all the circumstances, despite all the details, all the people that make this choice very difficult, that it's actually a very simple choice? That it really boils down to one or two things. What if I told you that there's a story, a character, a man named King Asa who helps us understand when we're standing here between plan A or plan B, when we stand in the midst of here, it really boils down to one of two choices of what you could do. And that's what I want to look at right now. And but. Before we dive into King Asa, I think we should do just a little bit of background on how uh, how King Asa is, who he is, because he's a, he's a king of Judah, and some people are like, what's Judah thousands of years ago? And once you understand a little bit of background, real places, real people, it comes more to light. And I want to go through a little bit of history before we get into the text. And it starts way back in Genesis with a man named Abram, and God said to you, I want to, to Abram, he, Abraham later, he is known as, he says, I want to bless you, and I want to use you to bless the world. The world was basically full of sin. It started out good, and then it became broken and corrupt. He said, I'm going to use you. God didn't give up on the world, and I'm going to use you to restore it in your people, and I have land for you, and so I want you to go take this land and begin to restore the world. And Abram, Father Abraham, had many sons, right? Because many sons had father. You've heard that. Now that song's stuck in your head. Um, And eventually, hundreds of years later, uh, this one person becomes the tribe of Israel, and they become a large nation. And in fact, uh, the nation of Israel, and there are 12 tribes, which were 12 brothers at one time, and they settle in this land right here. You can see the pictures of, of where they're going. And things are going well, except one of the things was they weren't really tightly, um, uh, a tight-knit group yet. They were still fighting. They were still attacked. It wasn't until a man named David who came along who helped unite them as a king, and he helped make them one person. And it is in David's reign that he actually expands this empire. This is David's kingdom. And this is the golden years of the Israelites. And we're looking at the, the kings in the line of this person, David, because after David, then the kingdom starts to regress and go backwards. And eventually what happens, you see with this guy named Rehoboam, is the kingdom splits into two. On the north, the ten tribes were called Israel. And on the south, basically the two tribes were called Judah. And there's this big split between God's people right here. And Asa is a king of Judah in the line of David in the split kingdom. And the text in Chronicles in his story, a couple kings removed from David, starts out like this. It said, Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He removed the foreign altars and the high places. He smashed down the sacred stones. He cut down the Asherah poles. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord. And I want you to take note of this. It says, seek the Lord. It says this over and over. The God of their ancestors and to obey his laws and commands. He removed the high places and incense altar in every town in Judah. And the kingdom was at peace under him. And so there was this unique culture. This is a primitive culture. This is pre-modern culture, ancient culture. They came from Egypt where there are known over 2,500 gods. 
from Egypt, not to mention all the other gods. There was a God for everything, every single thing, the rain and the sun and children, you name it, there was a God, except the Israelites believed there's only one, it's Yahweh. And the people who were serious about Yahweh got rid of all the other gods. And this is what Asa does. You look at like high places. Those people who worshipped other gods. Uh, Asherah. This is an Asherah pole that they would cut down. They would worship her. She was a Semitic goddess believed to be married to El. She was very popular in the time. And he removed all the high places, all the things. And it says things were going well because he would seek God and he was committed to God. And then there's a problem with Asa. And it happens right here in the valley of Zephathah. And you can see the arrow. Something happens pretty much on his border near near the Philistines. And it says this, Zerah the Cushite marched out against them with an army of thousands upon thousands and 300 chariots and came as far as Maresha. And Asa went out to meet him, and they took up uh, battle positions in the valley of Zephathah near Maresha. And so what happens is Zerah the Cushite, Cushites were considered Ethiopians. There's a lot of debate over who this guy was, but a lot of people believe Zerah was actually the commander, an Ethiopian commander of the Egyptian army. And the Egyptian army is said to have over a million people. And um, it is Asa's army has about 500,000 at this time. And they go out to meet him, and there's this battle, and he's wondering, okay, what am I supposed to do? He's sort of standing in this plan A, look, we could run, we could try to bribe them, what am I supposed to do? And then it says, Asa called to the Lord his God. He said, Lord, there's none like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, Lord our God, for we rely on you, and in your name we have come against this vast army. Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere mortals prevail against you you. And so he says to God, man, we need your help. Whatever you can do, we come under your name, your power. And then the Lord struck down the Cushites before Asa and Judah, and the Cushites fled, and Asa and his army pursued them as far as Gerar, and such a great number fell that they could not be recovered. They were crushed, and it said they carried off large plunder. And it's interesting He calls on God. God helps him win the battle. And in this time, you took all the plunder from the other armies, and that happens. And then it continues, and you see this word, seek God, repeated again and again. And it says, the Spirit of God came on Azariah, son of Oded. And the way the Spirit of God worked in this culture in this time is it would speak to one person, whether impress on him, say something to him, and the Spirit would say, go tell all the people of Israelites this. And this is what happened. He went out to meet Asa, and he said to him, listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you, and when you are with him, if you, what's the word say? Seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. So they entered in a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors with all their hearts and soul. And you're like, really? Were they serious about it? And it said, all who would not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, were put to death. Whoa. Whether small or great man or woman, they took an oath to the Lord with loud acclamations, with shouting and trumpets and horns and electric guitars. My version. All of Judah rejoiced about the oath because they had sworn it wholeheartedly. They sought God eagerly, and it was found by them. So the Lord gave them rest on every side. And rest in this culture is the most beautiful thing you have in a time when everybody else was at war. And so I could say that when Asa was sitting here in the middle wondering what to do, he chose plan A. And plan A would be simply this thing, to seek God. You see it over and over. And anytime you see in Hebrew, something repeated, you have to pay attention to it because the authors are making a point. And in two chapters, it's repeated like five times. Asa would seek God, seek God. So when he's standing here wondering, what should I do? The answer was, I'm just going to seek God. And when he does this, it leads to peace, it leads to prosperity, it leads to expansion, to growth, it leads to good things. And you're thinking, is such a good king, right? Amazing things. 35 years, there's peace. The problem with Asa, he rules 41, not 35. And what's really fascinating 
is what happens in year 36. Because in year 36, the authors and the way they wrote this story almost make it identical. In year 36, it starts like this. The 36 years of Asa's reign, Basha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and fortified Ramah to prevent anyone from leaving or entering the territory of Asa, the king of Judah. And I'll give you a picture. Here's what he did. It's split, right? So he comes down and he begins to fortify and blockade them because he is going to invade their country. He wants to weaken them the best he knows how, and it's to cut off all supplies that would go through there. There's a trade route that actually goes around there. And so Asa is sitting here just like in the past. There's an army on his border. Different side, but there's still an army on his border. And he's sitting here wondering, okay, what am I supposed to do? There's an army, just like before. I could do this, and I could do this, or I could go here. And he's thinking, what should I do? And it's fascinating how Asa responds. It says, Asa then took the silver and gold out of the treasuries of the Lord's temple of his own palace, and he sent it to Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, who was ruling in Damascus. And he said, let there be a treaty between me and you. He said, as there was between my father and your father. See, I am sending you silver and gold. Now break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so he will withdraw from me. And here's what he does. He says, here's 20 bucks. It's a lot more than that. I want you to go from the north and start attacking the king of Israel so that he'll have to withdraw what he's attacking me and go up there so then I don't have to worry about him as an enemy and it works. It said, ben he agreed. He sent forces against Israel, and he said they conquered all these cities, Dan, Abel, Maim, all the store cities. And then when Basha heard of this, he stopped building in Ramah. He, he hears of this. He leaves, and he abandoned all his work. And then King Asa bought all the men of Judah, and they carried away from Ramah the stones and the timber Basha had set up using it. With them, he built up Geba and Mizpah. So just like before, he wins and he takes all the plunder. And here's what's fascinating. It says, at that time, Hananiah the seer came to king of Judah. Just like before, another prophet comes. God gives him a word. He wins this battle, but this time it's different. He said, because you relied on the king of Aram and not the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped from your hands. We're not the Cushites and the Libyans, a mighty army with a great number of chariots and horsemen. Yet when you relied on the Lord... He delivered them into your hands. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You have done a foolish thing, and from now on, you will be at war. What was said last time? You will be at peace. Now suddenly, there's a guy that says, you've done it wrong, and now you're going to be at war. And Asa was angry with the seer. He was so enraged that he put him in prison, so he literally shot the messenger, right? And at the same time, Asa brutally oppressed some of the people. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was afflicted with the disease in his feet, and it just keeps getting worse and worse. You're like, oh, this is a train wreck. Through his disease, was, though his disease was fear, even his illness, he didn't seek what? He didn't seek God, but only the physicians he would seek. And then in the 41st year of his reign, he died and rested with his ancestors. And it's fascinating. Like the story is almost identical. There's an army, and he's wondering what to do. Plan A was I'm going to seek God. And when he does, it leads to this prophet coming down and saying, Good job. There is rest. There is peace. Year 36, there's an army. He's wondering what to do. And instead of seeking God, what does he do? He chooses to solve it. Greases the wheels. He wins it. But then there's another prophet that comes down and says, no, that's not right. It leads to anger, leads to resentment, leads to bitterness. You never see Asa again, even when he was sick, in a relationship with God. He even oppresses his own people. It leads to constant struggle. And it's fascinating how similar the stories are and how different the consequences are. It's almost as if the writers are making this point that Asa only had one of two choices. When forced with A or B, he could either seek God or he could solve it himself. 
despite all the details, despite all this, it really boiled down to one of two things. And there's two stories that are almost identical to prove this point, that when Asa was struggling here, wondering what to do, it was really only a choice of seeking God or solving the issue himself. I think the same is true for us. I said it sort of like this. The first step when we are faced with any issue is to realize it comes down to one of two plans. You can seek God, or you can just try to solve this thing yourself. Despite all the circumstances, all the people, all the players, all the minutia, all the times you get out the yellow pad, right, and you write everything down, what should I do, this, 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 all the things, perhaps it's not that complicated. Perhaps it comes down to one of two things. Will I seek God, or will I solve it? myself. See, we know what it means to solve it, right? Men do, right? A couple guys, we can solve anything. We're good at that. What does it mean to seek? Seek is the word bakash. Everyone say bakash. Good. It literally means, it's like one of these, uh, it, it reminds me of one of the worst feelings you've ever had when you lose your cell phone. Anybody ever lose this? And then you try to find it, and it's on vibrate or dead, and then you're trying to call it. That's the first thing you do. Then what do you do? You start tearing apart everything, right? Because your life is over. You've lost your phone. And you start tearing everything apart, and you can't find it. And then you start yelling at your spouse because they're like, did you check here? And you're like, of course I checked it, right? You've been there. Anybody? Some people are honest. And what do you do when you bakash your phone? You drop everything else, and your sole focus is to say, I'm going to find that thing. You ignore everything else. To seek God is this idea that I'm ignoring all the details, all the people, all the players, and I'm just going to simply slow down. I'm going to ask God. I'm going to focus on him. For some people, then it would mean prayer, silence, meditation. For some people, it means honest conversations means counselors, it means friends. For some people, it means reading scripture. How do I focus just solely on what would God say? God, is there anything you have to me to do when I'm standing here to seek him? And see, the thing about seeking God is that it's not that easy. I mean, it's easy to solve things. But when you go to seek God like that, it requires humility. That's why sometimes I'm not good at it. Because it's a position of me saying, okay, I, I can't handle this. I need your help. I have to let go. I have to let go of what I want the desired outcome to be. I have to let go of having to have everything together. I have to let go of having all the answers. I have to let go of wanting to try to save face, to say, you know what? I can't handle this. I don't know what to do. Seeking God isn't easy because it requires a position of humility like Asa did. But seeking God also requires a position of faith. And that's why it's difficult. Because it requires a faith that you believe God can actually handle this. That he's big enough. He's strong enough. He's wise enough. But also, one thing, he's good enough to give you the right answers, to help direct you in the right way. And see, when you seek God, it doesn't magically mean everything will get better. It's this magic pill, like this will happen, these great things will happen. It doesn't mean that. Because Asa still had to go to work, he still had to go to war, he still had worries and struggles. But seeking God, what it does mean is that you're humbling yourself, you're trusting God, but it also comes with another benefit. It means then, and this is repeated over and over, that God will be found. It means that when you're willing to slow down in this position and seek God, that he'll be there with you. Why? Because you've invited him. It's that simple. God gives you the freedom to make any choice you want. And when you invite him in, you're inviting in peace and love and joy and his presence into that situation. And see, God isn't found in the person who has all the answers has it all together, who can handle his business, right? God's found in the person who can set that aside and say, I need your help. That's what the writers are helping us see. I think that's what the story of Asa is pointing us to. When Asa was willing to say, God, I need your help, 
when he's willing to stand in that position and seek God, he still had to act. He still was probably scared. But he was willing to let go. And when he was willing to let go, God entered the situation and it led to peace and blessing. And I remember once sitting with a businessman. And the businessman was a friend. And he was successful, I think, at what he did. And he was telling me about an opportunity. And he was saying, oh, I did this and this. And I was like, well, you of course took it. It was an amazing opportunity. He was like, well, no. I said, what, no? He's like, no, I had to pray about it. I'm like, oh, yeah, pray about it. That's a good idea, right? As the pastor. And he said, you know what I realized? He said, every decision that I make, it comes with God first and then me second. Every decision that he made, he would first seek God and invite him into the situation. And when he did that, he said, even if I didn't know where I was going, I knew God was with me. And I think this is what Asa is trying to teach us. When you're in that position wondering what to do, plan A or plan B, it's really a choice of one or two things. Will I seek him? Will I slow down and pray, invite him to be part of this? Or am I just going to handle this myself? What would it look like for you, for the people in here that are wondering, what am I supposed to do, if you're willing to simplify that decision to one of two things? Would you seek God, or will you solve it yourself? I can't give you answers for all the problems. I can't give you solutions. I can't help you, but I can guarantee you'll be at a point sometime in your life when you're standing here wondering what to do. And I can tell you the truth. Won't necessarily make your life easy, won't have all the answers, won't mean you have to work. But if you're willing to seek God when you're standing here, I can guarantee you one thing God will be with you in that choice. And what would be better than having the Lord of all creation, the God of peace, the God of all wisdom, God of love, being with you? throughout whatever choice you had to make. Think of the confidence. Think of walking forward, even if you didn't know what you were to do, how willing and how confident you would be saying, I know God is with me. So for you this this morning, this afternoon, wherever you're at, Remember, when you're standing in this choice, in this position, plan A or plan B, King Asa reminds us it's really a choice of two things. Am I going to seek God or will I solve it myself? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the story of Asa. As unique as it was where he both did amazing things seeking you and at the same time, He tried to solve things himself. It's just like us. When we face issues, we don't know what to do. Sometimes we do well. Lord, sometimes we struggle. Try to handle it all ourselves. Pray for the people that are in here who are wondering what to do. They have a decision, an issue. I pray that you give them the boldness to lean into you and to seek you. And I pray, Lord, for the people that would do that, that you bless them that your presence becomes even more real and tangible, but you also give them wisdom and guidance on the steps forward. And we pray, Lord, this morning for those who have made the mistakes of trying to solve it ourselves, that's each and every one of us, that we have the humility to ask for forgiveness and start back over. Come alongside us when we do that as well. Father, we thank you so much for the story of Asa and how it's a reminder that every choice is just a choice of one or two things, seeking you or solving it ourselves. Give us the strength to be the kind of people that are humble enough and trusting enough to seek you. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 
Hey, thanks again for joining us for today's message. If you are looking for a way to prepare yourself for next week's message, make sure that you click the link below in the description right now, and that'll take you to our weekly devotion page. Weekly devotions are a very important part to our weekly rhythm here at the Foundry Church. We really hope that God spoke to you in a powerful way today, and we cannot wait to see you again next week.